I don't think I'm gonna go out today. Dihydrogen monoxide is falling from the sky. Now, even though we don't think of water as a reactive molecule, it's a very reactive substance. We just happen to be surrounded by it all the time. Yes, we all know the formula. Two hydrogens, one oxygen. Everyone's valence shell technically is filled and relatively happy, but based on electronegativity, who are we kidding? Hydrogen with oxygen? That's like the dweeb in the back of the class getting a date with the cheerleader. Honestly, oxygen? She could do better than hydrogen. And oxygen is always looking for a trade-up. And when she trades up to a carbon on the back of a polymer chain, that's what we call hydrolysis. So today we're going to be talking about biodegradation, specifically talking about biodegradation of polyester materials, synthetic polyesters. We're not going to be dealing with biodegradation of proteins or with biodegradation of biopolymers. That's for a different video. So when I talk about polyester, most of you immediately start to think of something like this. It's a typical cloth polyester usually found in the back of your closet, probably with that suit you bought in the 1970s because it looked really good on the disco dance floor. And you're going to think to yourself, but wait, polyester is not degradable. If anything, it's the lack of degradability. I mean, it is the complete opposite. The suit looks exactly the same as when I used to fit into it. Well, that's a very specific kind of polyester. That's polyethylene terephthalate. It has aromatic greens built into the backbone, which makes it very hydrophobic, very stiff, and very difficult for water to gain access to the ester units. The kind of polyester I'm talking about today is something more like this polyester. This is polylactide. It's a specific type of polymer. It is a synthetic polymer generated by mankind, and it is a polymer which has the capability for water to break down its main chain backbone so it becomes shorter and shorter and shorter parts. Now water does this by attacking specifically at the electrophilic carbon which is in polyester at that ester linkage. One of the processes that affects polymer degradation is crystallinity, and I'll give an explanation here as to that. We can think of previously how we described polymers as being like chains. So whenever you have a chain of polymer, these are the series of monomers along the backbone, of course. Um, the chain has a specific molecular weight, which is relative to its length. But these monomers in a biodegradable polymer can be broken by hydrolysis. Now for the purpose of the day we'll plan to treat these bulk cutters like it's water. It kind of looks like water a little bit. You got a little oxygen at the top here and maybe two hydrogens for the handle, but we'll, we'll pretend that these are water. So whenever this water comes into close contact with the chain at just the right configuration, that oxygen really starts to like that electrophilic carbon. When she sees that electrophilic carbon while well, she puts on her best dress and a little bit of red lipstick and she uh, ditches one of those hydrogens of hers to the curb, gets a hold of that carbon and she is to go. Now, we have this one long chain became two smaller chains. The polymer, in this case, simply decreased molecular weight. Keep in mind, everything's still here. Well, Everything's still here for now. Keep in mind, these chains are still the polymers themselves. The first sign of polymer degradation is simply the reduction of molecular weight. This is a process called random chain scission. So that simply means that water is going through breaking the polymer at randomly throughout the matrix of the polymer. At first, the polymer looks the same. It feels the same. It's only after this happens several iterations. So, 
if we take one of these chains here and we keep breaking it. So we have another reaction occur here. So now we have two even shorter chains. And then we have another reaction occur here. Oh, oh. Oh, that one didn't work now, did it? Hmm. Sometimes reactions work, sometimes they don't. You have to have all the uh, ingredients line up in just the right order. Well, more on that in a bit. So let's say we had a reaction occur here, and so on and so forth. Eventually, what you'll end up with, instead of chains of polylactide, you'll end up with just the lactic acid itself. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So when you have a polymer, depending upon the type of chemistry of it, how it's processed, how it's made, we have a couple of different ways that we describe polymers based on how the chains are oriented relative to each other. We think of the chains as being just kind of this mesh, kind of like a uh, lump of spaghetti, if you will. Then um, this is what's called an amorphous orientation. The chains are just mangled together. This is a great orientation for hydrolysis. This is very easy for water to come into it, uh, get plenty of access, break places all over the place, and just, you know, generally attack the chain everywhere it can find. This reaction here is pretty quick. So this type of material, it biodegrades very quickly when it's in an amorphous format. Alternatively, polymer can also be called crystalline. Crystalline does not refer to minerals or geology. Here, crystalline refers only to how are the polymer chains oriented. Are they random or are they lined up with each other? So here is an example of a series of polymer chains lined up. As you see, this nice orientation where all the chains are lined up, they're tight-knit to each other, it makes it really hard for water to get in. In fact, this provides what's called steric hindrance. Steric hindrance is simply a description for saying that two chemicals cannot react only because they cannot touch each other. In fact, it is steric hindrance that uh, really controls polymer degradation speed in this case because what prevents water from reacting to break the polymer has very little to do with the reaction itself. The, the reaction is pretty common. It's a water reacting with an electrophilic carbon is, that's going to happen. The question is how much access does the water get to the polymer chain? We have a very highly crystalline chain. It's just very difficult for the water to get in and cause degradation. For this reason, crystalline polymers, such as poly-L lactide, tend to take longer to degrade than amorphous polymers, such as poly-DL lactide, even though they are chemically the same thing. As polylactide breaks down, it forms into lactic acid. You actually experience lactic acid all the time, especially if you go to a gym. When you ever pump iron, or whenever you do any kind of exercise where your muscles are consuming oxygen faster than what can be provided, you are forming lactic acid. That's what creates runner's burn or that burn sensation you feel in the gym. That's from lactic acid. Now the human body has the ability to process and metabolize lactic acid. In this way, polylactic acid and other similar polymers such as PLGA or PCL or PLCL, they are what's considered a biocompatible material. That means the components that they break down into are either naturally found in the human body or are capable of being metabolized or excreted by the human body in a safe manner that doesn't cause damage to the individual. Ew, Carbon, I love you so much. Oh, Oxygen, you're my favorite. I can't believe I'm with this up. You may be wondering, so what is a practical application of this ability to take some polymer chains and break them down into something like water? Well, I'm glad you asked. There's two primary applications, the first of which is to generate material which is compostable. Uh, that is to reference a class of polymers which are designed to break down environmentally. And this is good for the world and for the environment, so there's less plastic floating in the ocean and these kinds of things, and so that's a very valuable uh, application. Uh, primarily in this video series, we'll be dealing with the other application, which is a medical application. We have the ability to generate polymers that can be implanted in the human body, can biodegrade over a period of time into non-toxic components. 
It's a very powerful tool when you think about it. Uh, it's actually been utilized in many ways already. For example, if you've ever been injured and you had to go get biodegradable sutures, uh, this is a mechanical application. So in this case, the polymer is providing a temporary physical support, which is degraded away over a period of time. Uh, that's one example. Another example is if you've ever had to receive a mesh or another type of uh, structural mechanical type material within the human body, which provides temporarily a way to give some kind of a structure or holding uh, mechanical property. So that's what you're working with in the polymers in that field. And that's one primary application that's used quite a bit, and we'll discuss that more in another video. Another application that comes into play for this one is also a medicinal application. So typically, whenever a medicine is either injected or ingested into the human body, it only lasts for a very short period of time before either the liver or the kidneys or some other excretory system removes it from the bloodstream. And no medicine lasts forever, and usually they last less than a few hours, unless they're very unusual cases, maybe up to a day, tops. So, if you ever have heard of or have received a once monthly or a once every three months or once every six months type injection, uh, you may be wondering, well, how the heck do they do that? How, how can you possibly give one injection that lasts an entire month? Well, typically, uh, this is accomplished using polymers. So they, they take the drug molecule or the medicine that you're looking to have uh, as part of the injection and they'll encapsulate it inside of a biodegradable polymer, similar to the kinds that we've been talking about today. And what occurs over the course of that month is as that polymer starts to break down, as the water of your body starts to break that polymer down, the smaller the smaller pieces, it releases that medicine molecule. That, that medicine is slowly released out of the polymer and into your bloodstream, slowly over a period of time. This allows for these once monthly or once every three months, once every six month injections to be generated and to work successfully. So you typically have polymer that's been injected into you and it's slowly releasing medicine. This is a very valuable tool as well. Um, so there's a couple of the practical applications of these types of polymers. As we go through this series, we'll be talking a lot more about these biodegradable polymers, their practical applications as well as we'll be discussing what kinds of polymers work better for what application. Uh, commonly, people will ask, well, what's the best polymer? Well, there's not a best polymer. It's the best polymer for what you're looking to do. There's no such thing as a best polymer as you can say, well, what's the best car? It depends upon what your goal is, and that's something we'll be discussing in these next set of videos.